Hi, I'm here with my wonderful colleagues, the composer Mason Bates and the librettist Mark Campbell, the duo who is responsible for the amazing success of the new opera, The Revolution of Steve Jobs. We had a little chat right before opening night of this new production in Austin, Texas. This is your first opera together, is that right? Yeah, this is my first opera, period. This so is your first opera? First produced, luckily for this piece, there were a couple of false starts that had some chances to learn things. Yeah. And uh, how did it all start? Like, well, Mason? yeah, I mean, there was years ago, um, before Santa Fe Opera got involved, Cal Performances um, was interested in an opera and they asked me, what would you want to write about? And I felt like um, living in the Bay Area for a while, I felt like there was this opportunity to write about um, a creative technologist and to, to kind of include that figure um, in the pantheon of creative individuals that opera has explored. You know, there's like Death in Venice to, you know, La Boheme to Tales of Hoffman. Opera can really explore artists. And I feel like Steve Jobs um, really behaved like an artist, even though he created this giant company, he, he really, kind of ran it um, with an artist's passion. And um, I found Mark Campbell because, you know, he's this uh, leading he's Mark librettist of, of our time. And he, he immediately um, just resonated with this idea of how can we treat this figure who's both protagonist and antagonist in a way that um, is not really a biopic, but um, is almost a kind of a kaleidoscopic approach to his life that would have an emotional arc um, from beginning to end in kind of one breath, so one act. You know, I find that interesting that every person that uh, thinks about Steve Jobs has a different, a slightly different lens. Sometimes it's very, it's a dichotomy. You know, some people say he's a villain, some people say he's a saint, you know. I feel like the two of you have, uh, see both lenses. But my feeling is that you admire him a little more than Mark did. Yes. Yeah, Is definitely. that correct? Yeah, I mean, when, when, when Mason first proposed the idea and it was his idea, I was like, oh God, not Steve Jobs, because I hadn't done my research and I just had a negative impression about him being sort of just a corporate prick who you know, acted like a hippie and all that. But then I just, you know, of course you start with the Water Isaacson book and I read that and then I went, oh yeah, Mason's right. There's something, there's really a an incredibly complicated and also, I, I will agree with you, artistic individual here that needs to be explored. Yeah, he, he has this positive charge, this charismatic and creative, and he definitely has a negative charge, which is controlling and um, kind of hyper-managerial. Um, and I find that the ground between those two charges is his wife, Lorene. She's really the one that was able to um, speak directly to him um, to put her foot down, say that you need to treat people better, you need to get chemotherapy, whatever it is. And so that was another incredibly important part of the story um, that we both agreed on very early was that um, the role of Lorene would, would kind of grow in importance over the, the course of the opera and, and even sort of steal the show at the end where she has these two big arias to close the piece. That's a little bit of, uh, I mean, I don't know if it's called a coup d'etat or something, but it's 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 really a bit surprising for people um, to have this character who's not in the title of the piece um, really grab our attention at the end. And that was a deliberate um, switch of focus for us. And we felt like you know, her voice was really important in this too. Absolutely. You know, when uh, I work on a piece, I start the piece in a certain place. And during the time that I do the research and work, I discover so much about those characters. like. I did a Julius Caesar, and at the end of it, I was like, I felt that I understood him much more than when I started. Mm. When you started working on Steve Jobs, both of you, you probably had an idea about who he was, and today you may have 
known more about him than you did before. What surprised you about what you discovered along the process? Well, for me, I was, as I started reading all of these um, anecdotes, and, and you know, I went everywhere for, after reading the Ozzy Slim book, um, but I, I found like connections, like um, in the sense that I did acid, of course, yeah. I told you I sold it in college and stuff. Um, and that was a significant moment in his life. And he says this as, as much. He says, like, doing acid was very, very important to me. It, like, it opened him up, um, his mind and his heart and everything. Um, there were other moments where I just felt like, oh, I, well, also, I worked as a graphic designer for many years. Yeah. So I knew the importance. I worked in advertising. So I also had that sort of background that I could bring to this about how you promote something and how you make something look. And the aesthetics of the Apple product, I mean, early on were revolutionary, were extraordinary. And the more I read about the idea that he wanted to democratize the computer and to make it more human, um, which sounds so frightening to us now because it's become way too human. It's become like the, our, our devices are appendages now. I just saw some connections between his life and my life and involving advertising, graphic design, doing acid, um, not being centered in my life and then suddenly finding a center, which is what I found in opera. Um, and it just made it easier for me to tell the story. I mean, you, you can't do... A, an opera about something, about someone, and they're an awful person. You have to find something in their heart that the audience can can agree with or understand or empathize with. Uh, otherwise, there's no reason to do a story. And you did find something that I had not much um, knowledge about, which is job search for inner peace. You know, this Buddhist element of the story is really interesting, and particularly the figure of Kobun, his spiritual advisor, um, became a really big part of the opera. And this search for inner peace uh, is is really like a, a central, kind of almost like a conflict in Job's life because clearly he wasn't um, restful inside. You know, he's very busy creatively. He's always kind of fidgeting. He's always searching for perfection in a kind of obsessed way. Yet he wanted to find this inner peace, and we felt that that was be that would be a really important part of the story. So Mark really bore into that. And that musically um, gave the piece this other element, um, this Asian element of and specifically Japanese with you know, these kind of low alto flutes, this kind of world of uh, electronic prayer bowls and things that kind of washes in to give the this other kind of meditative element. And I think Mark really brilliantly connects that to um, the design philosophy, um, which is again is a central um, is a conflict. Is the beautiful, seamless design something that is about, you know, interfacing with these instruments, these devices, or is it really about control, locking down all of the control of the device underneath this beautiful, sleek exterior? And so that was all really coming out of this search for simplicity that, that Mark really bore into. Yeah, I found it really interesting that uh, when you do a work about somebody, it ends up being about a part of you that mm. is reflected in that person. So you shared with us uh, some of that. What about you, Mason? Like, where is where is the where is Mason Bates in the story of Steve Jobs in this opera? I feel like all artists and um, maybe a good percentage of people can relate to some of the the key contradictory elements of Steve Jobs. Um, you know, whether you're uh, a composer or whether you're um, a surgeon, you, know, you probably, you know, have this drive to make things right. You know, you really want to get something perfect. And I feel like that search for um, perfection is something that I can absolutely relate to, you know, whether it's writing this opera or a piano sonata, I can relate to that. And the, there's a straight line between this um, ostensibly, uh, you know, positive aspirational search for like a perfect piece of art and um, kind of obsessive micromanaging control, you know. Better, where, better, better. Yeah, I want to make everything better, better, better as, as the chorus sings and like the climactic scene. Um, and that can can lead into your, your personal life when you're trying to micromanage the people around you and, and you're, whether it be 
um, your family, or in the case of Steve Jobs, you've got pancreatic cancer, and you're trying to um, control that with carrot diets and homeopathic medicine. That's where Lorene says, you know, you're taking chemo. This is over. You know, you're not controlling this anymore. So that 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 search for perfection, it really can be a beautiful thing, but man, it can really it can really lead into the dark side pretty quickly. I love that. <laughs> this is gold. It's true. We it's all know gold. that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you feel the same. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, I would also add though that it's our job as um, composer, as creators and as directors to create a story that does come from someplace in our hearts because it, then only then will the audience relate to it. If, if it's way outside of us, then the audience is not gonna feel it either. Yeah. So we had to find our heart in this story. And that's why, personally, I, I feel so connected with this. And thank you for entrusting me with directing this because, you know, I, I feel he's very controversial. But as I look at his story, I find so many human similarities to my path as well. You mm -hmm. know, trying to juggle a family and a business and try to do good, but also try to do perfect work. And it's well, a as, a, as as a senior member on this panel, I also relate to. Um, his um, his feelings of mortality. Yes. Um, that there's a moment in this where you resent the, the line you resent the dimension. And what oh. Mason did with those three little dorky lines, um, it's one of those great moments in opera where the words are like, let's just put those aside a little bit and let the music take the heart. And that's why we love opera. Um, and it's just those three lines there always get me. Like, you're dying, you're, Steve. You're, yeah, yeah. That, that's and the piece about the opera that um, I think surprises some opera goers when they're thinking this is going to be about technology. It's, this is a story about a man who changed, you know, the way civilization communicates. It is about that to a certain degree, but at the end of it, it's really about mortality. Mm -hmm. And you know, this tragedy of Steve Jobs, which I think he really maybe can trace to his need to control, um, you know, his cancer and maybe losing valuable time doing that. Um, that tragic flaw, you know, that it, it goes to his mortality. And I think opera audiences, um, perhaps one reason they've embraced the piece is because it is very much about that very human topic, which opera can explore so well, which is death. Yeah. And the reality distortion field. You know, as we, uh, mm -hmm. as we record this, there's a big um, ice storm that is supposed to hit Austin and threatening our opening night. And... If Steve Jobs was here, he'd probably say, what ice storm? This is yeah, he would, he, absolutely, he, absolutely, <laughs> you're absolutely right. Yeah. Oh. Now, the, the, the piece had an amazing success, like unbelievable success. Multiple cities are doing it. You won the Grammy, congratulations. Did you expect this? I know you probably expected this to be. Why do you say that? Because <laughs> you're Mark Campbell. No, I, it's not that I, I never know what's going to be. I mean, no, I... I I thought Did you wanted to pull the chair for another show. Should, should, but that, that's, a, that's a whole different story. Um, I did actually expect a success with this, but the reasons for it are outside of the story. So then we're talking about the business of opera. When Mason Bates writes something, people listen. So I knew right away that there was going to be a great deal of success connected with that. I'm not a fool um, in that regard, and I am ambitious, but I did not expect it. I, I, I didn't, it's becoming a phenomenon. Really and that's something I didn't quite expect. And, but that's also due to you with this new production. Uh, so I'm grateful to you for making that happen. And, and Mason, how, how did it feel like all this accolades and Grammy and... I mean, really the, the biggest first moment for me was um, the opening night in Santa Fe when we got to the very yeah. end oh and, and the audience response. Because it, it's a bit of a hard thing to do a one act that feels like a full experience um, and, and it feels like this arc. And Mark and I, we were juggling on the one hand a piece that has uh, many new elements. You know, there's just a lot of new electroacoustic things. There's this brilliant nonlinear storyline. Um, and then it has some traditional elements and it's kind of a number opera with very clear arias and whatnot. Um, and we were trying to put all that together into a piece that goes from start to finish in about a hundred minutes and um, needs to leave the audience feeling like it's just been this breath. And it was great to feel that we had the validation of, of the audience in the opening night because 
until that moment, we didn't really know how it was going to feel. I think, you know, as it's gone on, it's been really cool to see how different people have experienced in different cities, but now to see how you've reinterpreted it in this beautiful way in this production. And um, not only just, of course, there's this new set, but there's a new just kind of um, concept to the piece. And, it, and I think in some ways, both a, um, a streamlined simplicity to it, um, but also a re-examination of some of the, the, the key elements of the libretto, which is um, there, there are elements of, um, you know, Asian theater in it and the way it's presented that um, are really present in this, even if in a subtle way, seeing the characters that aren't on stage kind of, uh, or aren't in this, are not in the scene kind of still on stage, kind of waiting to go on in a kind of almost an abstract way. And then when, when they do come together, I feel like you really find a way to, to, to get the most of them emotionally. So it's got both a very human element and this cool abstractness to it. Mark, you watched it yesterday as well for the first time, mm -hmm. what surprised you? What struck you yesterday on this new production? Um, I, well, I, I I really loved, I mean, what Mason said before, I really loved having all the characters, the main five characters, oh man, but five characters on stage almost all the time. I thought that was a, it's just fantastic because this opera, this whole opera pretty much exists in Steve Jobs' mind. Mm -hmm. So he, everyone, the way this story was written, it's not a typical story where someone enters, does a scene, and then they go off. They're always in his mind because they're always part of his memory. And he is just sorting through his memories. And you don't sort through memories by having someone enter, knock on a door, and then leave, you know, do a scene and then leave. They float in and out of your mind. And I think the word just, a word just came to me, um, the fluidity of the production. I really love because it's the fluidity of memory. It honors that. and. That's what we were, that's what we were aiming for. We weren't aiming for a biopic. It's not like we don't start, you know, him on the hospital bed um, looking back on his life. He looks back on his life in a whole different way uh, through meditation and also through the way memory leads from one memory to another. It's never in a chronological order. And um, yeah, I would say the fluidity of this production really, it's, it's really extraordinary. There are some um, very specific things. I don't know if you want to hear about, but. I love, first of all, how the, the, the production really responds to the music in, in, a very, um, in a very integrated way. I mean, obviously opera should do that, but um, the way this does it is, is almost like you're watching um, uh, you know, a film or something where it's, it's been worked out carefully in a studio for months and months in post-production, yet here we are watching it live. Um, I think about some of the interludes when um, you know just the projections and the the movement of characters around on stage is all just incredibly um, synchronized to the music, and it it makes the piece feel a little bit different from an opera. I mean, it, it almost has a a kind of a show element to it, or like a music theater element that that I think is really exciting. And and the way that the um, there are levels on this uh, on this product in this production that give us all these different spaces to work with, even though it's um, on the surface, like it, it's a simpler production in many ways, um, but in terms of the, the forces involved, but when you put all of the elements together, it actually is um, unbelievably complex and rich and a lot of different places you go with it. Thank you. You know, I, I have to uh, say that I've been working in this field for over 20 years now, and there are a couple of pinnacle moments for me. One was Silent Night, mm -hmm. and I feel like uh, this premiere is going to be another moment that I'll never forget, and it's because of the work that you guys did. I mean, it, it captures the humanity of it so profoundly, and I think that's the reason for its success. It just hits you in the face, and we saw it yesterday in the final dress rehearsal, so mm -hmm. I want to thank you for enriching my life and so many people's lives with this. It's well, thank you for, you know, bringing your vision to it and taking it to so many new cities. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this conversation uh, with Mark Campbell and Mason Bates, the composer and librettist of The Revolution of Steve Jobs. This is a major new co-production between five different opera companies in the United States and Canada. It will premiere in Austin, Texas, then travel to Kansas City, will come to us 
to Atlanta and then continue to Canada, to Calgary Opera, and then it will have another stop in Salt Lake City for the Utah Symphony and Opera. <laughs>